Shemi Kavasso. Dr. Kavasso is the head, the director of the non basic Pathology at Korea Medical Center. He's a skilled echocardiographer, extremely interesting information and studies of the heart. Okay, I'll try to speak about uh, how do we measure function in, in our patients, in our oncology patients, and I'll show a little bit of, of uh, our experience and others' experience. Well, the most preferred parameter that has always been used is the ejection fraction, which is measured by various uh, methodologies. The one, first one is the visual score, and you can see that there's a 5 to 10 percent uh, increment, so that it's a very difficult um, parameter to follow and to see minor or minute changes. And it all, the other thing is about the visual score is it, it's something that is very much uh, needed for, with a lot of training. Uh, the other thing that we do, we do the T-shots. It is automatic, automatically done in all the, all the echo machines. It only looks on, on circumferential function, only one aspect of function. So it, we assume that the, the others are, all, all the other parameters are similar to that, and that there's no other or um, well motion abnormalities in other aspects that are not seen in that picture, which is the one on, on the left. The other thing, the, the, the most common, commonly used and most endorsed by the American Society of Echo and others is to use what we call the bi biplane Simpsons rule, and it's a way that looks at the end diastole, end systole, do, doing uh, endocardial contours and measuring the difference, calculating for that from a, by a very elaborate way of measuring of, uh, volumes of discs, and usually it's quite representable. But the best way probably to do that and is to do it on left on 3D echocardiography. We have the best correlations with MRIs. It most of the time is semi-automatic because the contours are reproduced, are produced by the systems uh, by themselves. And if we look at the uh, left 3D left ventricular EF with the correlation coefficients and the blood Altman curves, we can see that it correlates very nicely. So this is one method. What are the caveats of LV ejection fraction? First, it is obtained by echographer. It has a 95% confidence interval and a very large uh, standard deviation. So subtle changes, as I said before, are very, are very easily missed. It depends, of course, on image quality. It is a little bit low dependent and a little bit heart rate dependent, so it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to follow that way. The next thing is something that is around uh, commercially since 2005 is what we call the what we call mechanical imaging, myocardial mechanics imaging, and the concept is strain. Strain comes from physics. It takes um, measured deformation in one axis. We can do this, of course, in many axes. But what we want to have is a we have a, an unstressed length of a of a of a material, and then we. I either lengthen it or shorten it and measure the change by percentage. If we look at the, what we have in the, left, if in the left ventricle, the normal number is about one of shortening is about 20% shortening in, in systole. This is probably the normal number. And in circumferential, we have a little bit more and we have a gradient from base to apex, which is in, increases. The larger negative number, of course, means more shortening and better contraction. So what do we, do we measure? I mean, the, the machine that does it actually follows speckles of lights, and then we can measure displacement. We can measure displacement in the radial direction, which is in what we, what we look as thickening. We can do it circumferential displacement, which is the rotation, which changes from base to apex, both in magnitude and direction. And we can look at longitudinal displacement. If we take two speckles that are adjacent and measure the distance between them, we can actually measure the strain. And of course, the same parameters, circumferential, longitudinal, and we can actually measure a, a, a geometric average of them, which is called the principal strain or the strain vector in the direction of the actual shortening of the sarcomer. We can measure thickening, which is the radial strain, and we can measure the time derivative of that, which is the strain rate. So this is how it looks. If we would get a graph that starts from 
zero, which is the, the unstressed and, and diastolic uh, and, and, um, length, and then it shortens by 20% and goes back to normal, to the to baseline. One measure that is very, uh, has become the most uh, uh, stated by all the, all the um, studies is what we call the global longitudinal strain, which is the average of longitudinal strain at time of aortic valve closure. We measure the strain, the peak of strain, or the number that crosses the, at the timing of AV closure, and we, can, we get actually a peak that is meaningful about what happens, what is the contributing to systole in these patients. Another thing, to, another thing that we can measure is if we look at that, we can see that not all, not all the peaks happen at the same time, so we can actually measure the peaks themselves, and then I'll go back to that because this is another way to look at what happens in oncology. So if we look at, this, at studies about strain and LVEF, and we can measure, and if we look at the left side uh, graphs, we can see that the changes in strain are earlier than changes in EF. We can see that uh, the, higher, the, the higher part here shows that we have this near the same EF, but already significant decrease in longitudinal strain, which is, of course, the, uh, the, uh, what we call the global longitudinal strain. And if we look at all kinds of parameters that have been looked at, and we get the best uh, ROC curve for the GLS, or global longitudinal strain. So if we look at the uh, position paper, and the position paper that actually, uh, not the position, but of course, is a summary paper of, of all the, of a lot of uh, work that has been done uh, using strain. It was done by Palandish Savardirinatan from Toronto. And if we can look at all the, the, big, the largest table in, in the manuscript, you can see that any parameter that is derived from this software has been tracked. Glo uh, global longitudinal strain, rotation of the apex, uh, difference between rotation of the base and the apex, what we, call, what we call twist. We look at strain rate. All these parameters have been checked, have been looked at, and probably the best one that has remained, the one that is the most uh, uh, robust, is the global longitudinal strain. And if we, we can see actually that the changes in, uh, in the prediction of reduction, actually reduction of EF, well, we can see that the global long tool strain is actually the one that is the most predictive. So what are the conclusions? In 1,504 1, patients during and after cancer chemotherapy, we've uh, uh, done three uh, clinical relevant scenarios. Speckle tracking was done. Pixistolic global long tool strain was measured and appeared to be the best measure. There was a 10 to 15 percent early reduction in GLS by speckle tracking during therapy, and it was the most useful parameters. And GLS cor correlated with prognosis and reduction in EF and heart failure. So, what has been the, one of the most approaches of, of that system was its reproducibility. So, if we look at uh, EF by two dimension, we get. Uh, um, if we look at the inter-class uh, coefficients, we see uh, the lowest number for 2D, a larger number, a good, a better co better uh, um, uh, better match with 3D, and the best one, of course, is comes with GLS. The other thing that is important about strain is the experience of the user. So this is how the the co the inter-observer viability changes, or intra or inter-observer viability changes with the experience of the observer, the one who does it. Uh, if we look at the one that, uh, that has done no cases, we have a very large variability, but the one who has, has done more than 100, and sometimes even expert more than 10,000 cases before, we see that the, the, uh, we have a large reproducibility of, of the results, and we can actually count on it. The most important message of this slide, which is very important, is that you have to do strain a lot to be reproducible, meaning that you have a learning curve that you have to fulfill and work until you can say that you can reproduce your results. In 2016, we had a position paper 
of the European Society of Cardiology about uh, the follow-up of patients of cardi cardiovascular toxicity. And what we can see here is, is uh, above the LVEF, that is everybody has been speaking about all the time, we also added the, uh, the global longitudinal strain as a part of the, of the system we evaluate. The one thing that is important is that they, they ask you ask us actually to see if there's a change in all these parameters, meaning that we need to have a baseline first. So this is one thing that we have to take, bear in mind, that in patients with it, we are going to treat with cardiotoxic drug, we, could, we should have a baseline echo to know, what ha to know how it decreased later. And if we want to look a little bit further into even uh, more interesting parameters of strain, of looking how things change with the treatment, this is actually not, a, not one of the drugs that we've talked about. This is a patient treated for Crohn's disease with infliximab, which is also biologic uh, therapy. And we can actually but see in that first panel that we see that we, we see all the peaks joined together. I mean, if we look at what happened in the aortic valve closure and together, the, the all peaks coincide. So if I can, if I calculate the global longitudinal strain and the average of strain peaks, we get a number of, of one. Then I'll show that later. The first stage, however, is you get a normal average strain, but you have a large dispersion of strain. You have areas with compensation and you have areas with low strain. So the average strain will be normal, EF will be probably normal, but you already see that there's some changes. When you get abnormal strain, which is the average is still, you have a large dispersion of strain, but still now the average is below normal, then you will have probably reduced EF. This is the other term that we are looking for, and if we go back to, this, to the lecture that uh, Oren Caspi gave in the morning, we know that there's conduction abnormalities. We know that the QRS is prolonged. So we're looking also for something that is electrophysiology. I mean, looking for uh, delays. So the, another and one way to see about the synchronicity of the contraction of the left ventricle is of, to look at the to look at how the uh, peaks coincide. If they coincide, you will get one as a fraction of the average strain versus the the uh, average of peaks. If you have peaks that, that happened before end systole and after end systole, you can actually get a, an average graph that is lower than the average of the peaks. So you can actually create a global mechanical synchrony index, and if it's less than one, or a lot less than one, it could be a very uh, early change that you can actually look for. And this is how it looks for 17 segments. You can actually calculate it. It's in normal patient, it's near one, and it's very uniformly so. And in patients, this is a, an example for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you can actually see that you have a larger, uh, uh, a larger dispersion of timing of strain. So if you have a, a very minute dyssynchrony that was not there to begin with, you can actually see or anticipate reduction of strain. Another way to do that is, of course, in 3D. Um, now, various machines have the ability to do 3D strain. It, they can do it actually by taking a 3D image and then, uh, I would say, downgrading to the regular three-chamber, two-chamber, four-chamber views and do the strain from all of these, or actually calculate the actual principal strain in direction of contraction, like we've seen here. So we get a 3D strain map, and so actually will give you the number for the actual strain that looks at the longitudinal and circumferential strain at the same time and gives you actually an, 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 uh, an understanding of its compensatory uh, state. So this is all we can say about strain. Uh, the most important message is if you want to see changes in strain, you have to have a baseline. The second message is if you want to do strain, you have to do it. You have to do it in your regular cases. You have to do it repeatedly and then when you have your first oncology patient, you can actually do the follow-up. What I do in my lab is because there are differences between the methodology between machines and people come all the time and they sometimes encounter the, a specific machine from a specific vendor anytime they come. 
So uh, what I say into the, to, to my, uh, my staff is when a patient comes and he's done on one vendor's machine, he is now married to that machine and the next time he has to be checked on the same machine so that I don't have an intra-machine or inter-vendor viability on top of my own intra-observer viability. Thank you very much. Yes.